أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى آل بيتك المظلومين الغر صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء سيدي يا ليتنا ثم يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما فديت قتيلا بالطفوف مرملا فديت قتيلا بالطفوف مرملا وليس له إلا الدماء يا أبو طريح على وجه الصعيد ورأسه على الروم حطراف البلاد يجاب وزينب لما لاح رأس شقيقها أشارت إليه والدموع عباب أخي أحرقوا عند العشيخ يا منا أخي أحرقوا عند العشيخ يا منا وليس لنا إلا الأكف في نقايا يا أبو أخي سلبونا وسياط تنوشنا وسيق بنا سوق الإماء حرايا أخي 
بعدكم من يحرس الرحلة والحما أخي بعدكم من يحرس الرحلة والحما ومن بعدكم يا طيبي إن يجابوا لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون طيب وفاهكم بذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد على محبة أبي عبد الله الحسين الشهيد العطشان المرمل بدمائه في كربلاء الثانية بأعلى أصواتكم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى على محبة أمه الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة المرضية الثالثة بأعلى منها اللهم صل على محمد One of the questions that we often get when it comes to the memorial sessions and the mourning of Ahl al-Bayt is that why do we focus on the tragic side of the events? They ask you, why is it that instead of focusing on the positive aspects, and I say this in quotation marks, of the personalities of Ahl al-Bayt, you focus on the negative aspects and those being the tragic ones. Why don't you just talk about the ethical standards and the moral behavior of Ahl al-Bayt, their conduct with other people. Focus on that rather than, and, than force people into shedding tears and into crying for Ahl al-Bayt. Well, to answer that question, the first thing we must say is that an emotional outpour, my friends, is not a controlled and calculated sentiment. It comes as a natural response to the tragic events that were faced by Ahl al-Bayt, to the calamities that befell the holy progeny of Rasulullah. If your father, God forbid that ever happened, but if your father passed away, even through normal means and circumstances, you wouldn't need a controlled environment where you would sit down and you mourn. You would cry simply because you feel the urge to do so. When we remember the tragedies of Ahl al-Bayt, we are overwhelmed with the feeling of grief and sadness and sorrow. That is point number one. Two, if you are an opponent of crying, and of course you're not, but if there is a person that disagrees with the whole concept of shedding tears for the tragic events in Karbala, for example, then you are not only going against the Holy Quran and the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, but are also defying hard science. Science actually says that the benefits of crying are exactly the same as the benefits of laughing. It relaxes the body. But that's not the reason we cry. We have verses in the Quran where Allah the Almighty Creator says, He tells the story of Yaqub, for example, who shed tears over his son Yusuf. Allah the Almighty says. He cried so much, he cried for 40 years. That's a long time to shed tears. Especially when he was a messenger of Allah and therefore he knew that his son was well safe and alive. He knew that Yusuf wasn't dead. He knew that he was being taken care of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet he cried. He cried because he was deprived of the ability to see his son. He cried because he lost his son who was the closest to him. He lost his son who was going to be a messenger and a prophet. And so he cried for 40 years after which his eyes were blinded. Because, the amount of, because of the amount of grief and the amount of tears that he shed through his eyes. 
he deliberately, if we can use that term, because he does have control over his emotions, he could have stopped himself from crying. He could have just said to himself, look, it happened, he's alive, let's just move, move on with life, and there will be a day when he will return to me. He could have done that, and yet he chose to cry. He chose to express his emotions anywhere, anytime. And so he deliberately did something that eventually led to his eyes being blinded. So if there's anyone that tells you you shouldn't cry, tell him this is a verse in the Quran. And it's not about a layman, it's about a prophet and a messenger of Allah, and that is Ya'qub. Peace and blessings be upon our prophet and his holy progeny, as well as Ya'qub. Also, the prophet was the first one who shed tears over his son who died at a very young age, Ibrahim, who's now buried in the cemetery of al baqi on the holy city of Medina. May Allah all grant us all the ability and the honor and the privilege to visit them and to visit the Ahlul Bayt and to visit the Prophet of Islam in the city of Medina. The Prophet, when his son passed away, he cried so much that he attracted the attention of some of the companions that actually objected to the Prophet's outpour of emotions. They approached the Prophet. One companion actually had the audacity to tell the Prophet, why are you crying so much? I buried three of my own daughters alive and I didn't cry that much. This was back in the Jahiliya time, at the time of pagan ignorance. He tells the Prophet that, you know, I, I killed three of my own daughters. I buried them alive. And I didn't feel that bad about it. Why are you shedding so much tears on your son Ibrahim? And so the Prophet responded by saying, al tadma." وَالْقَلْبُ يَحْزَنْ وَلَا نَقُولُ مَا لَا يُرْضِ الرَّبِّ The eye sheds tears. The heart is saddened. But we never say something that invokes the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We never blame Allah for our, our calamities, for example. We never object to His ruling. But it is only natural for someone to cry when there is a calamity that strikes them. So that's the second point. The third point is that we do focus on the positive aspects of Imam Hussein and the Ahlul Bayt. Their teachings are a source of inspiration for us. Their lives are lanterns of guidance for all of us to follow. However, the historical context is a very important facet of their lives. We can't ignore the tragedy of Karbala and say, let's just take out, cut out the words of Imam Hussein that he uttered and the sermons that he delivered in Karbala, but not worry about everything else that happened. The historical contest must be held in high regard because it is very relevant to the words and the teachings and the sermons and so forth. And the most important reason that we tend to focus on the tragic side is so that you and I, my brothers and my sisters, remember that the testimony to the succession of the Prophet of Islam and the fact that Imam Ali is the vicegerent of Rasulullah, the testimony to Ashhadu Anna Ali and Waliyullah, this did not reach us on a silver platter. We focus on the tragic side so that we always have this in mind. Ashhadu anna aliya waliyullah didn't come cheap. So why is it that some of us sell it at the cheapest prices? It didn't reach us free of charge. So why is it that some people are willing to give it away in return for petty, miserable, transient, short-lived pleasures in this world? Why is it, my brothers and my sisters, that some of us, unfortunately, are willing to hand over to the testimony of the succession of Imam Ali, the testimony of Ashhadu Anna Ali Waliullah in return for a music CD? Why is it that some of us are willing to give that up in return for a disgusting pornographic image? Why is it that some of us are not reluctant to abandon their belief in Ashhadu Anna Ali Waliullah with a twinkle and a smile 
and a short-lived pleasure that doesn't last except for a, a mere seconds. Why? This is why we have to focus on the tragic side, my friends. I swear to God, when I remember these stories, shivers are sent down my spine and I ask myself, why is it that I, I'm not talking about you, why is it that I and people like me don't care that if they have to give, the, give up the blood of the martyrs in exchange for something that's truly, totally worthless. al Hasan al-Muthallath was the grandson of Imam al-Hasan, al-Hasan the third. Imam al-Hasan had a son whose name was Hasan. He was called al-Hasan al-Muthanna. That son also had a son named al-Hasan. He became known as al-Hasan al-Muthallath. This was a man that exercised piety in the most noble meanings of the term. This was a man who was given the ability to pray and Allah would answer his prayers. He was, as we call him, mustajabu da'wah. If he prayed, his prayer was never left unanswered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many people do you know that are like that? I personally know none. But there were people in history and continue to exist. People that pray and Allah would respond to them immediately. Because of all the things that they have done. Because of all the sacrifices that they have given. Because of all the things that they gave up on so that Allah would be happy with them. Who cares if the people are unhappy with me? Allah is happy with me and that's all that matters. Who cares if my peers and classmates at school don't like the way I dress up, if I wear black on the day of Ashura, for example, or don't like how I have a beard? Who cares if society pressures us into doing things that are, that are contrary to the teachings of Islam? It doesn't matter for as long as Allah is happy with me. al Hasan al-Muthallath reached that level. He's imprisoned by the Khalifa at the time. And he was along with a few other of the followers of Ahlul Bayt because they suffered persecution in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. The city of Baghdad, my friends, was built on the skulls of the sons and descendants of Fatima al-Zahra. They would literally take them while they were still alive and place them within the pillars when they wanted to build a building or a castle for the Amir or the Khalifa. So al Hasan al-Muthallath was imprisoned in a very small prison cell below the surface of the earth and he was in the company of many other of the followers of Ahlul Bayt and one day one of the people in that prison cell he dies and his body is left there for quite a while until it starts to decompose. And the body is very quick to decompose. It decomposed and it became morbid. It became a source of disease. And the people that were with Al Hasan al Muthallat, they all knew his status and his posi position. So they approached him by asking him to pray to Allah so that something would happen, so that they would be saved, so that they would be released or something. Because that body became morbid and someone else died because he caught a disease from that morbid body, from morbidity. And another person died from morbidity. And a third person died from morbidity. So they approached him, they begged him, they said, please do some dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have us released so that we don't die one after the other. So he smiled and he said, last night I saw a dream and I saw my position and our position in paradise and I saw the position of the Umayyads or I believe it was the, uh, the Abbasids dynasty I saw their position in hell now if we are released my friends we will not reach that position in paradise and if these tyrants release us they will not reach that low position in hell so I would suggest we keep things the way they are so that we can attain the highest level, levels in paradise and they all agreed. One of the guards was listening. He was overhearing the words of Al-Hasan al-Muthallath. He went and told the Khalifa of the time. 
that this is the conversation that took place. So the Khalifa ordered that prison to be demolished and the, and the, and the ceiling to be destroyed to bury the dead with the living. And that's just one story from our bloody history. A man who was close to the Khulafa of Ben al-Abbas, one day a friend of his goes to his house, and this is during the month of Ramadan. And he enters the house, and it's noon. In the month of Ramadan, everybody's supposed to be fasting. But he is shocked to see that this friend of his, who was close to the Khulafa, was close to the... Uh, the emirs and to the rulers, he noticed that he was eating. So he said, so wh what's wrong with you? Are you sick or something? He said, no, I'm not sick. I just never fast. He said, but why? Aren't you a Muslim? He said, look, I have done things in my life that you can't even begin to imagine. I have done things that I am 100% sure that Allah will never forgive me. You want me to fast? I'm going to hell anyway. He said, what have you done? He said, well, one night, the Khalifa called upon me. He sent his, his, uh, his guards and his police to get me to his palace. And I went there. The Khalifa was very angry. He looked, at, he looked at me and said, have you been plotting a coup d'etat, a revolution to oust me? He said, no, I'm not. He said, but there are reports that I'm getting that say you're a Shia and that you love Ahlul Bayt. He said, but I don't. He said, okay, prove it to me. He said, how, what should I do? He said, what are you willing to give in my way? He thought for a while. He said, I am, oh, Khalifa, I am willing to give you all my possessions. I'll give you my house. I'll give you my money. I'll give you anything that I possess. The Khalifa looked at him and said, well, that's not good enough. He said, but what, you want, what do you want? He said, what are you willing to give up? He thought for a while again and he said, well, I, I'll give you my life. I'll, I'll die for you. He said, would you? He said, yes, I would. Because he thought that if he said no, he'd be killed anyway because he was accused of being a Shia. Being a Shia was an accusation that attracted the death penalty at that time. And this is not too strange for us to believe. It's not too inconceivable because we saw what happened in Iraq. And we saw how people were killed simply for reciting salawat in a loud voice. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We saw how people were killed simply for mourning the death of Imam al Hussein. We saw how people were killed simply for insisting on visiting the mausoleum of Imam Hussein. It was a, a very, very grave accusation. If you really hated someone, you would go and report him to the police and say that he loves Ahlul Bayt. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. The poisonous propaganda of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was so bad and so effective that one day a man, I'll just draw two brackets before I finish the, that story. One man is walking through the streets of Damascus and he notices that everyone's name you know, when, when fathers call their children, their names are Omar, Uthman, Marwan, uh, Walid, you know, all these names. And he didn't hear any, any, any of the names of Ahlul Bayt. He never heard Ali, he never heard Hassan, never heard Hussein. And that wasn't a very big surprise for him because Imam Ali was cursed on the pulpit of Rasulullah for 90 years. In fact, it was so bad that... Abu Sufyan, when Uthman assumed the position of leadership of the Ummah, Abu Sufyan, because they were related to each other, they came from the same tribe of Bani Umayyah, Abu Sufyan was blinded at the last, in the last years of his life. And so when Uthman assumed the position of the leadership of the Khilafah, Abu Sufyan went to congratulate him and he said to him, you know what Uthman, I think this is the time to remove the name of Allah from the Adhan. This is the time that we should obliterate and annihilate the religion of Islam now that we have the power in our hands. So this man is very surprised. I mean, he's not very surprised that the name of Ali is never mentioned until he hears a father calling his son Ali, Hassan, Hussein, Ja'far, Zainab, come over here. 
So he approaches that man. He goes to him. He says, uh, "Salamu alaykum." You know, I, I I noticed something really strange, and that is that, that you call your sons Ali, Hassan, Hussein. He said, "Why is that? You know, nobody ever does that in this town, in this city, and in this country." He said, "Well, yes, because I have heard that." It is not good. If your sons have a good name, you can't curse them. And so I named my sons Ali, Hassan, Hussein, Jafar, so that I could curse them at my convenience. This is how poisonous the propaganda machines of Muawiyah were. And so this man tells the Khalifa, again back to the main story, he says to him, I'm willing to give you everything I have. I'll give you my life. He said, that's not good enough. What else are you willing to give up for me? He said, I'll give you my family. I'll give you my children. I'll have them all die in your way, O Khalifa. He said, that's not good enough. So the man thought for a while, and he realized what the Khalifa was asking him to do. He said, I am willing to give up my religion for you. The Khalifa then had a smile drawn on his face, and he said, that's what I, was, that's what I wanted to hear. That's it. Okay, prove it to me. He said, how? He said, well, there are right now, I have a prison cell that is filled with 70 of the descendants of Fatima al-Zahra. Back then they were called Alawiyah. I have 70 Alawi who are imprisoned and I want you to kill them, very basically. It's simple. Just go kill them and you'll prove your loyalty to me. I'll know that you're not a Shia and, you know, um, everything's going to go back to normal. We're all going to be happy every after. Uh, happily ever after. So he said, but, but what, what, what is their crime, if you don't mind me asking, O Khalifa? He said, well, frankly, that is none of your business. But in case you're wondering, their crime has already been stated. They are the descendants of Fatima al-Zahra. Isn't that enough for you? He said, oh, of course it is, of course. He said, then go kill him. It was night time. It was after midnight, he was given a sword. Now remember the Khalifa had mercenaries. He had all these guards. He had the executioners. They could have done the dirty work for him. But he wanted this man to do that, to carry out the task of killing people simply for being relatives of Rasulullah so that he could test his loyalty. He gives him a sword, sends him off to the prison. He goes there. He opens the gates unlocks the doors, enters. Now just imagine these sons of Rasulullah, some of them very young, some of them very old. They all get up, they were asleep. They wake up, they stand up, and they're very excited because they, they think that this person's come to, to take them out of the prison. So he says, I'm going to have to kill you all. So he beheads each and every single one of them during that night. And so he says to his friend, you're asking me why I don't fast? I killed 70 people in one night simply because they were Sayyid. I'm not going to fast. I'm going straight to hell. Why do we sell cheap, my friends? Hajr ibn Adi, a very loyal companion of Rasulullah, he's buried in Syria in a place called Marja Adra. If you ever go there, Go and pay your respects and give your tributes to Hajr ibn Adi. This great, great man of honor and of faith and belief in the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This great man of the testimony. Ashhadu anna aliyya wa liyullah. Allahumma salli ala wa He's taken captive by the troops of Muawiyah. Incidentally, the name of Hajr ibn Adi was mentioned in the treaty that was signed between Imam al-Hassan and Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. SubhanAllah, the crimes committed by Muawiyah, the son of the wicked Hind who chewed on the liver of Hamza, Sayyid al-Shuhada, the crimes that he committed, I swear to God, up until this very day, we are feeling the repercussions and the effects of the crimes that he committed back then. 
up until this very day. The people that, that shed innocent blood in the holy city of Karbala and in the holy city of al kazimiyah and the holy city of, ne of, of Najaf, they do so, they kill innocent people because they feel empty. They feel that they should have been there to, to, to support their master Muawiyah and to support their master Yazid. And they want to kill Imam Hussein, but because they can't get their hands on him, they kill his followers. May God curse him for the rest of eternity. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, he captures the, he captures Hajr ibn Adi along with his close companions. There were about 20 of them. And he takes Hajr ibn Adi along with his four sons. He had four sons with him. They were all grown-ups because he was very old. And even though the name of Hajr ibn Adi was mentioned in the treaty between Imam al-Hasan and Muawiyah, and Imam al-Hasan specifically mentioned his name, and Muawiyah agreed to that condition, so that Muawiyah would never bring any harm to Hajr ibn Adi. And yet, this is what he did. He captured them along with his sons. What was the crime of Hajr ibn Adi, incidentally? It was simply for standing up in the mosque where a sermon was being delivered and the sermon began with cursing Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. He stood up and he objected. He said, I will not allow you to curse my master and Imam. This was his crime. Again, between two brackets, there are so many stories I can mention. We could go on for months talking about the bloody history, not, e not the recent history of the Shia, but the history of the Shia and the companions back in the time of the Imams. One day, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, again in brackets, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, this bloodthirsty monster, was sitting in the mosque and he went up, he, he stood up and, and went, uh, went out to do something. He came back uh, a short while later and he noticed that one of his aides, one of the people working under him, one of the ministers, was occupying his position. He was sitting where Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi was sitting. So Hajjaj came up to him and said, I swear to God, unless you have something that I don't have, I will have you beheaded right now. So that minister thought for a while, and then he said, I do have a good quality that you lack. He said, what's that? He said, when you get up on the pulpit and you give a sermon, you begin the sermon by cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. But I begin my sermons by cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib, Fatima al-Zahra, Imam al-Hasan, and al Hussein. I curse them all, and then I deliver my sermon. He said, Wallahi innaha la makruma. You are right. This is a quality that I don't have. And so he let him live. So, this was the crime of Hajr ibn Adi, that he objected to the sinister slander of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace and blessings be upon him. He's captured with his three or four sons. They want to kill him, to cut the, sto the, the long story short. They want to have them all killed. So, they ask Hajr ibn Adi, they say, okay, you're about to be killed, who wants to go first? He says, kill my sons first. So they look at him and say, you know, we expected everything except for this. How could you be so heartless as to let your sons be killed before your eyes just so you could delay your execution by a few minutes? How could you do that? He said, no, that's not the reason I'm asking you to kill my sons first. I would never, ever give up the testimony of Ashhadu anna aliyya waliyullah. I would never Abandon my faith and my love for Ali ibn Abi Talib, even if you cut me into shreds a million times. But I was afraid that if I am beheaded before my sons, that they would give up their love for Ali ibn Abi Talib and that they would be forced into cursing him. And so I wanted them to die before I do so that they don't see the sight of their father being slaughtered in front of them and that they don't bring shame to my name before Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so they took their, his sons one by one, started slitting their throats, slaughtering them like sheep. And Hajr ibn Adi would come to his sons and say, Oh my son, say Ya Allah. Say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Say Ya Muhammad. Say Ya Ali. Say Ya Fatima before, before they kill you. And they killed them all. And then they killed Hajr ibn Adi. Why do we sell so cheap the blood of these martyrs? Another man, Maytham al-Tammar, 
His occupation? He sold dates. There were thousands of them in the city of Kufa back then. He wasn't unique at all. He wasn't rich. He wasn't important. He wasn't a marja. He wasn't a faqih. He was just someone who sold dates on the streets. He was a slave. Imam Ali freed him and he became a close companion. Ibn Ziyad captured Maytham al-Tammar and he put him through this slow, brutal, and painful death by being crucified on a cross. He had him hung on a cross and he let him bleed to death. But Maytham al-Tammar, my friends, he seized the opportunity and he called out, O oh people of Kufa, come here, I want to tell you about my master Ali. I, know I, t I want to tell you how good he was. I want to tell you how close he was to the Prophet. I want to tell you how important he was in the eyes of Allah. I want to tell you his teachings. Oh, people of Kufa, come here. And he's on the cross. So Ibn Ziyad orders that his guards would use an iron truncheon, an iron mace, to hit the face and the mouth of Maytham al-Tammar. They hit him on his mouth. His lips were cut. His teeth were smashed. His tongue was cut. Blood all over his shirt. And he was left to die in that way so that he doesn't speak. SubhanAllah, on the cross. So, you know, sometimes I, I think about this and I feel that when I come into these gatherings and I give these speeches before you, my good friends, you know, people respect us you know people sometimes when I walk they want to shake my hand they want to they want to kiss us they want to greet us they want to welcome us but I haven't really done anything important I haven't done anything to be proud of I come here before you we're all brothers in faith we share the same beliefs we respect each other in an atmosphere of love respect and harmony I get up here say a few words and then get down if you want to kiss someone you have to kiss the hand of Maytham at Tamar if you want to love someone, you have to love Maytham al-Tammar. And he's left there on the cross for a few days until his friends gather. And they bring him down and they bury him only to create a shrine that is today visit, visited by millions of people. If you go to the city of Kufa, and I hope you all do, you'll notice a few very strange things. One, Maytham al-Tammar has a shrine of his own. And if you go there, you'll see thousands of people going in and out, visiting, paying tributes and respects to this great man who spoke the truth on the cross. You'll also notice that Muslim ibn Aqil, Imam Hussein's ambassador to Kufa, is also buried there. He's got a shrine, he's got a golden dome. Whereas Dar al-Imara that was occupied by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, may Allah curse him, is now nothing but an empty block of land, a part of the desert, there's nothing there. And you look at that, and you look at Muslim ibn Aqil. You look at the humble house of the commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen. Very tight, very small, and it's actually been expanded. It's a very, very humble house. And it's still standing. Whereas Dar al-Imara, a building composed of many levels, is now leveled with the ground, subhanAllah. Finally, another story. I don't want to take too much time. This is the night when Ahlul Bayt are crying. When the children of Rasulullah, when the daughters of Imam Hussein have no one to harbor their grievances. One last story. Zayd ibn Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, the grandson of Imam Ali, the son of Imam Zain al Abidin, the grandson of Imam al Hussein. He was actually, the, he was pursued and he was captured and he was killed because he led a rebellious insurgency against the Khalifa at the time. After the demise of Imam al-Hussein, after Imam al-Hussein was martyred in that brutal manner, he rose up, he waged a revolution against the Khalifa and he was then captured and he was killed. After he was killed, he was hung on a cross to serve as an example for others, so that no one else would think about leading an insurgency, a rebellion against the Khalifa.
Now, if someone was heartless enough to do that, to hang a body, a dead body on a cross, to serve as an example for others, how long would they leave the body over there? Five days? A week? Two weeks? A month? Six months? A year? He was left on the cross for five years. Just hanging there. And after five years, he wasn't given a proper burial either. The Khalifa was riding close by in the proximity of the cross, and he, and he saw that. He said, what's that? They said, well, in case you don't remember, this is Zayd ibn Ali. You killed him, and you had him hung on that cross over there. He said, well, bring him down. He was left there, according to our traditions, for so long that birds, be that birds began to nest within his body. He became a nesting ground for birds and for animals, subhanAllah. This is the grandson of Rasulullah. And so the Khalifa said, bring him down. So the Shia were all very excited. They were happy that they could now finally bring down the body of their, of their master, the grandson of Rasulullah, bury him properly. But no, they didn't do that. Because the Khalifa brought him down. Then he ordered his, his body to be burnt. And the ashes were dispersed into the air so that he didn't have a shrine for people to come. Why is it, my friends, that we sell so cheap the blood of these martyrs? Why do we curse Yazid and Muawiyah then? By our actions, we revive the culture of Yazid and Muawiyah. We keep it alive. Where is the culture of Imam Hussein? Where is Imam Hussein in our lives? Why do we sell the blood so cheap for these transient, petty little pleasures that we think are significant and important in our lives? Why do we do that? Why is it that some of us, unfortunately, they don't have any regard for our awaited Savior, the Imam of our time? Don't the youth know that their sins cause a scratch on the face of Imam al-Hujjah every single day. I mean, don't we know that... Why do we add insult to the injury like that? By committing sins. Why do we do that? I swear to God, Imam al-Hujjah has suffered so much, I think he's had enough. He's had enough from his enemies. Why should he now be insulted by his friends? And the people that call out his name. The people that pray for his reappearance. Why? Why is it that we do all these things? And Imam al-Hujjah every single day. He says, He addresses his grandfather, Imam al Hussein. He remembers his tragic death. Scenes of his martyrdom appear in his mind every single day. He remembers the time when his grandfather fell from the back of his horse onto his face and he cries. Isn't that enough? Don't we think that he's already, he already has enough pain in his life that we keep committing all these sins? And we sell his faith and his name so cheap. Hasn't he had enough? Imam al-Hujjah every single day he remembers his aunts. And their daughters and their children, when they came out after the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein, they came out running, but not to a specific destination. They didn't know where to go. They had no one to harbor them, to protect them. And so they kept running from one side to another. He says in the ziyara known as Ziyarat al Nahi al Muqaddasa, he says, فَخَرَجْنَا النِّسَاءِ مِنَ الْخُدُورِ نَاشِرَاتِ الشُّعُورِ عَلَى الْخُدُودِ لَاطِمَاتِ وَلِلْوُجُوهِ سَافِرَاتِ وَبَعْدَ الْعِزِّ مُذَلَّلَاتِ he says they came out on that day when their Imam, when their protector, Imam al Hussein, was killed. Umar ibn Sa'd called out to his troops. He said, Burn the houses of the evil ones. 
all the women gathered together. They went to Imam Zain al Abidin to consult him. What should we do? Where are we going to go? Imam Zain al Abidin didn't have much of a solution. He said, Ya Amma alaykun bil firar. Try to flee and escape with your lives. Try to go wherever you can go because these men want to kill you. They want to burn down the tents because they want no one from this household to stay alive. Amma they went towards the body, the bodies of their dead ones, the body of Imam Hussein. One, one of them would take some of his blood and smear it onto her face. One of them would try to protect the body from the shine of the sun. Then it was, it was the time for Zainab عليها, to bring all the children together to protect them. She was the only one that could carry out that task. But then when night fell, all the children began to realize that their loved ones had departed. One girl would call out, Amma Zainab, where is my father? The other one would call out, Amma Zainab, where is my brother, Ali al Akbar? The other one would say, where is my son? And so Zainab couldn't do anything. She would go to these children. She would hug one girl, one of these women, until she came down and with calmness and then she would leave her and go to the other one she really had nothing to say she couldn't tell them that their father were, was killed she couldn't tell them that their sons were killed she couldn't tell them that their brothers would never return would never come back to them <laughs> تحيرت والله بيتاماك وما ينحمل يا حسين فرقاك 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 and then when night fell Zainab went out of the camp in order to visit her brother's corpse that was lying on the ground but as she was looking through the bodies the battered the butchered bodies the decapitated bodies that were severed into pieces she was looking for her brother she was looking for her brother Hussein she was looking for her brother Abbas but mainly her main destination was Abu Abdullah al Hussein as she was going through the bodies she heard a woman crying saying Oh Ali, my son, oh my infant son, I now have milk to God to offer you. She went and tried to find this woman and she realized that it was the mother of Ali in Al Azhar. She was crying out for her son, saying, Oh my son Ali Waladi Ali, I now have milk to give you. You're about to die of thirst. I now have the milk to offer you, oh son. 
Lady Zainab comforted her, condoled her, and then she started looking for her brother Hussein. But how would she look for him? Imam al Hussein didn't have a head. Imam al Hussein's body was cut into pieces. How would she be able to spot her brother? Well, she looked for the for the most, for the greatest amount of arrows that had struck one of the bodies, and she knew that it was her brother Hussein. She approached him. She sat next to him. The tradition says that she then kissed him. But Imam al Hussein didn't have a head. Where did she kiss him? She kissed him on his throat that was cut and severed and, and separated from the body. And she also kissed him on the chest, on the area that was struck by the three headed arrow. <laughs> Then she looked towards the direction of Medina. She called out, Ya Muhammad, Salla alayka maliku sama, Hada Hussein, Madarajan, Ala al Ramza, Hada Hussein, Maslub al Imamati wal Rida, O Rasulullah, O grandfather this is your beloved grandson he's lying here here without a head or clothes this is your grandson that you love this is Hussein <laughs> يا جدي قوم هذا حسين مذبوح على الشاط وعلى التربان وطروح يا 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 جدي ما بقت لمن الطعين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين. You know we're all sitting here tonight and we have these candles to light the room. But the daughters of Imam Hussein had no candles on that night. They had lost all their candles. The candles were lying on the plains of Karbala. Imam Hussein wasn't around to shine with his face. Ali al Akbar was dead. Al Abbas was cut into pieces. Al Qasim, they were all dead. They had no one. They had no one to protect them. They offered them some water. They came to the daughters of Imam Hussein after the death of their men and they offered them some water. They started from the oldest girl. She rejected to take, she refused to take the water. She rejected, rejected the bowl even though she hadn't drank water for three days. She refused to take it. The bowl was then offered to the next one. And she did the same thing. She refused to take it. I'm not going to drink any water. While I know that my father was killed while he was thirsty, she refuses it. The next one refuses it until they get to a, a four-year-old daughter of Imam Hussein. As soon as they offer her the water, she takes it to everyone's surprise. Why would you take the water? But they notice that she doesn't do anything. She takes that bowl full of water and she runs towards the battlefield. She says that I heard my father call out, al atash al atash where are you, Father? I have water for you now. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah al-aliyyil-azim. 
اللهم إنا نسألك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العز الأجل الأكرم يا الله Raise your hands please يا الله 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 اللهم إنا نسألك بحق فاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها أن تعجل في فرج إمام زماننا يا الله اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين يا الله اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الحسين يا الله اللهم اقض حوائجنا بحق الحسين الشهيد المظلوم اللهم شاف مرضانا بحق مريض كربلا زين العابدين اللهم تقبل منا هذا العمل من المؤسسين مؤسسة آل البيت اللهم احفظهم وأيدهم وسددهم اللهم احفظ وأيد وسدد علماءنا ومراجعنا العظام خاصة سماحة آية الله العظمى السيد علي السيستاني اللهم احفظه بحفظك أيده بنصرك اللهم وارحم موتانا موتاكم موت الحاضرين موت المؤمنين والمؤمنات هم في أمس الحاجة إلى الدعاء وإلى العمل الصالح اللهم ارحمهم جميعا وإلى أموات المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب سورة الفاتحة مع الصلوات